What's going on, Jerome's? Uh, Minnesota Fighting Vikings training camp is approaching about the halfway mark, and got some preseason, got some gloriousness coming up. Night practice going to be on Monday. First preseason game on Saturday. Lots of things going on. Uh, but we, we got some predictions. We got some nine. Nine. I counted this time. Nine. Calling our shot predictions for the Vikings uh, mid-training camp. And uh, some of these aren't, like, shocking. Okay, maybe they're a little shocking. Who knows? Number one, McCarthy will be QB2. Now, it's a little bit shocking in that everyone and their mom predicted that McCarthy would have been QB3 at the start of training camp. Now, there, there's push there for a while where McCarthy, uh, respect, McCarthy has consistently looked pretty damn good throughout training camp. A little, little bit of an off day on Friday, step back up on Saturday. There's a lot to like for the future. And slinging Sam Darnold took his sweet ass time to get consistent, uh, looked really good on Friday, Saturday. Uh, so I think that he will be able to hang on to the starting job. But I, I'm not ready to say that he will have a lock on it all season long because uh, if he plays good, obviously he's going to keep the job. But if he's a little bit inconsistent and uneven, uh, McCarthy could be in there sooner rather than later. But I, I think that in terms of roster construction, I think that the Vikings uh, will keep uh, two quarterbacks on the 53. Uh, I think they potentially will take their chances with Mullins and or Jaron Hall on the practice squad. Uh, and also, I think Mullins could be a potential trade bait, uh, w which we talked about uh, before, uh, because competent veteran quarterback play does have some value. And yeah, the Vikings would like to hang on to Mullins, sure. But also, if if, you, if you're on quarterback three, the season's like sort of kaput anyway. So just play Jaron Hall. Yeah, yeah. Uh, next up, number two. Uh, Diamond Dallas Turner leads the team in pressures and sacks. Now, that that isn't as insane as you would think, right? E even though people say, like, oh, Turner's not going to start. Shut up. Uh, obviously, uh, Turner's going to – so Turner's probably going to play 65 70% of the snaps uh, this season. Uh, I think that there will be many instances where Turner, AVG, and Grenard are on the field at the same time. In fact, that might be part of the base package. But either way, in terms of straight-up pass rush, obviously he's going to get more involved uh, in that area as he's adding some size, adding some technique, and working on uh, setting the edge against the run. But Turner's going to be a force, man. Like I, I'm calling – I think that he's going to have a – 17% pressure rate, and also I think that he's probably going to rack up at least 10 and a half sacks uh, on route to a uh, defensive rookie of the year, and I, I actually don't think that competition is going to be close. Next up, number three, Levi Drake Rodriguez leads the defensive line in pressures. Now, uh, again, on his face, that seems a little bit shocking, but then if you look through, so Tillery, hopefully uh, that injury isn't as bad as it looked. Harrison Phillips doesn't really bring a ton as a pass rusher. Jonathan Bullard uh, is more of a run defender. Jonah Williams is sort of a meh, whatever. Jaqueline could uh, be the one that uh, that uh, competes with them. But in terms of the actual defensive linemen, so not including the edge rushers, I mean, who else is going to bring it? And even if LDR is a situational rotational player only and pl only plays about 20 percent of the snaps if they're all on passing downs and his mandate is very clear hey go get the quarterback uh, i think he very easily could lead uh the defensive lineman in pressures next up number four uh blake brandle ed ingram win the guard competition so Overall, like it, the first team has been pretty static. So left to right, it's been Darisaw, Brandel, Bradbury, Ed Ingram, Brian O'Neill. Now uh, they flipped Reisner back and forth between left and right guard, so he can potentially be that swing guard. But uh, I think right now, as long as there isn't any, any, as long as there isn't any seismic shifts or just complete meltdowns, like I, I don't see them changing things up uh, because you haven't even seen like a rotation. Uh, at this point. So that uh, certainly is noteworthy. Uh, and Ingram, of course, is the in-house guy headed into year three. They want him to succeed, uh, being a high-drafted pedigree guy that he is, as well as Brandel. I mean, obviously, there's a vested interest in Brandel since they did give him the three-year, $9 million deal, and they brought back Reisner as more of an afterthought. So uh, I think that there's certainly a vested interest to have Brandel and Ed Ingram uh, given every opportunity to win the job. And I think that's uh, what's exactly going to happen, and Reisner uh, as the swing backup, which certainly will take him as a backup. Number five, uh, Gabriel Murphy will play 100-plus snaps. So Typically, you play just over a thousand snaps uh, on offense and defense, and Murphy, I think, will get in there situationally as a pass rusher, and it's going to be a lot of fun, man. So, AVG, Grenard, Turner, Patrick Jones, second has really had himself a nice camp, even though we tried to trade him, uh, and then Gabriel Murphy is in there as well, and I, I think Murphy has certainly has a chance for some staying power. I think that he's a perfect fit for what the Vikings want, want in a new age outside linebacker. He can run, he can cover, he can uh, he can rush the passer. 
He's very mature uh, with his pass rush moves. Like he's definitely not just like the raw rookie. So I think the league done effed up uh, having him go undrafted and having him land here with the Vikings again. Like uh, so, Murphy McLaughlin as well as LDR in the seventh round. I mean the Vikings. Vikings did really good at the back end of this draft as well as in UDFA. Next up, number six, Johnny Munt will be a top ten fantasy tight end. While Hawkinson is out, asterisk. All right, so uh, if you look at the Vikings tight end room, so yeah, Oliver's going to stay with his role as the blocking tight end. Robert Tanyan's been uh, out with uh, the back spasms. Nick Muse I like a lot, but it's very clear that Johnny Munt is the receiving tight end. And he's built up some really nice chemistry with uh, with Sam Darnold, who is going to be the presumptive starter. Uh, Munt has caught touchdowns in back to back sessions uh, over the last two days, and I think that I mean Darnold's obviously got some chemistry there. Plus, if, if you think from the defensive perspective, their mandate number one is going to take away Jer- Jefferson and Addison and Johnny Munt. Who the f is Johnny Munt? Who the f is eighty six? So I actually think that Munt could get some significant work early and often uh, with Sam Darnold. And it wouldn't shock me, like, say Hawkinson, maybe he doesn't even start on the pup, which would be fantastic, but say he's out the first two or three weeks. I think Johnny Munt could be easily be a top 10 fantasy option during that time just because of volume. And I think that he may rip off the odd uh, touchdown here or there. Plus, given the lack of depth uh, at the tight end position, I mean, you certainly could do a lot worse. Like, I... Not giving away my, my stupid fantasy strategies, but I if if the opportunity presents itself, like I am going to take Hawkinson in the you know, sixth, seventh, so, somewhere in there, and then I'll just pick up Johnny Mundell later on, j- just as a streamer until Hawkinson gets back. I bet. Uh, next up, number seven, uh, Dwight McLaughlin ends up as cornerback four. Sorry, Nudie McLaughlin. I don't even want to know. Uh, Nudie McLaughlin ends up as cornerback for – actually, uh, I was going to update that, except we don't have it. But uh, So I, I do think that it will be Shaq once he gets back from his hamstring. Uh, Murph, obviously, uh, Caleb Evans could be in that mix. Dwight McLaughlin could be in there as well. Uh, Fabian Moreau uh, has had some great moments uh, as well, uh, already working with the first team. Uh, they don't know and trust him. But I actually will take McLaughlin over Duke Shelley, uh, even though Duke is obviously a, a folk hero here with the Vikings. I, I think McLaughlin – and simply played better, uh, and I think that he's a lock to make the 53, and I think that he will be in line for some serious snaps uh, co- coming down the pipe. I, I think McLaughlin has really done well, and I, I think obviously he's going to impress in preseason uh, as well. Next up, number eight, they will add one more splash free agent, and not sure where. Like Cornerback does make the most sense, but what if it's a spot where, say, Tillery's injury is more serious than – that than you would like. Do do the Vikings make a splash at defensive tackle? Do they pick up someone who's going to be a cap casualty? Do they, they just add someone at, at fifty three man cuts? I think it's possible, but I mean the the most logical one would be I don't know Stephon Gilmore, J.C. Jackson, just really getting a name uh, there in in that cornerback room. But I mean we'll, we'll see. But it also could be a spot too. It's like hey. Uh, offensively, I think they're good to go. Uh, prob- probably going to be on the defense, so I guess guess you never know. Uh, lastly, number nine, there will be one shocking veteran cut. Well, actually, we should say roster. Really good at spelling. All right, so th- there will be one shocking veteran roster move. And not, ne- not necessarily will be a cut, but you know the dirty part of the business is – I mean, veterans with large cap numbers and large uh, base salaries with nothing guaranteed. I mean, 53-man roster cuts is the time you put the squeeze in. And, you know, Kwesi's already done this uh, before. Spielman uh, did it a ton. Every GM does this. And it, it's a little bit uncouth, but the business is the business. Because what happens is, especially older veterans, so they have the larger contracts, generally have kids. Kids are already enrolled in school. And you, know, you don't want to supplant them, uh, and you just don't want to move to a new city. So they're given the option of a pay cut or a cut cut. And like I said, it's a little bit dirty pool, but you know th- that's just how things go. And I, I think that even though coaches obviously love C.J. Ham, I-, I could see the Vikings just trying to squeeze a, a little bit out of C.J. Ham. And-, and usually it's to save cap space, and sometimes a player can make it back with incentives, uh, but C.J. Ham would be uh, a candidate for that. Uh, I think that Dalton Reisner, if he doesn't win the starting job, could be a candidate for that. Maybe they uh, rescind some of the guarantees and, or and his uh, per-game uh, bonuses there. Basically just skin him down to uh, the 
uh, bare minimum, uh, veteran uh, minimum, uh, and then just just go from there. Defensively, I mean, Harrison Phillips potentially, Jonathan Bullard potentially. Uh, so, I mean, like, like I said, it's not – it's not great, uh, but saving a few hundred K, I mean, that does add up to uh, a couple million potentially uh, saving against the cap. Now, I, I don't see it as drastic as a cut. Like, I don't see them cutting or trading Harrison Phillips, maybe Jonathan Bullard. Uh, but in terms of, like, Reisner, probably not trading Reisner. Uh, unless we said, hey, Buccaneers, you just lost your starting guard. Uh, third rounder third rounder and i i don't see them just straight up cutting cj ham i think it's too valuable uh to the operation in all phases but yeah i think that there's going to be there's going to be some squeezing uh going on here uh towards the end uh, of camp uh especially if the vikings do end up bringing like a stefan gilmore or uh who knows uh in that regard but that's it uh nine nueve shocking actually hold on one two three. yeah nine nine uh shocking predictions let's know your thoughts our thoughts you guys know what to do skull production value.